Let me just be very frank. Keep your questions short, and I will ask my uh, speakers to try and respond objectively. Thank you very much. Hi, and thank you for your presentation. My name is Jorge Rivera, and I work for the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building, which is a partnership hosted by DOECD, um, the Development Assistance Committee, actually. Hearing your presentation, you know, um, we have to ask, you know, that the role of aid going forward. In terms of crises, you know, there's a recognition that it can both help and harm. Uh, we see that ODA hasn't really increased as much as it should. There's questions about donor commitment, there's questions about what will be obeyed for things like refugee crises. Um, we at uh, the International Dialogue promote this framework called the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States, which seeks to basically um, encourage, encourage actors to uh, change their development approaches in fragile and conflict states. My question is, aid is growing, though very little. There's questions of donor commitment to, to really hitting the 0 0.7 mark. Um, but are we doing more and are we doing better with the ODA money that is available? Have development principles worked in your view? And how can we make sure that going forward, whether it's a crisis or in long-term development, we, we uh, get political actors and development actors to make better use of development aid effectiveness principles? Thank you. Um, I hope I didn't miss anyone, but over here in front. Yes, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Thomas Sama. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Helsinki. My question is addressed to Rob Voss. Um, in your presentation, the focus was more on uh, food production, but I think that um, there are two other great challenges on food security, which are food distribution and food con conservation. Now, in many parts of Africa, um, there is a lot of food production in one area, but the biggest problem is that the food is not, um, the farmers are not able to transport the food to other parts of the country and to other countries because there, are, there is a lack of good roads and infrastructure. So what is being done about that? Then the second point is food, um, that's about food uh, distribution. The second point is, is on food conservation. Now, a lot of food is, is, is produced during the harvesting season like mangoes, tomatoes, and so on. But because of uh, the lack of means of conserving them, some of them, they get rotten because they are, uh, they are perishable food. And so during the time of no production, there is uh, an unavailability of food. So what is being done about food conservation? Thank you. Inge Kaul, uh, I uh, have the following suggestion. I'm wondering whether there is a lesson to learn from uh, the financial system and from financial markets where we differentiate between excessive volatility and normal volatility. Because uh, this distinction I was missing in the presentations, one can of course build resilience and that is necessary and good, but should it not be resilient, resilience to normal volatility or to the unknown unknowns? Uh, could we not identify to what extent uh, societies and countries today suffer from excessive volatility? Why is there so much problem in the food security area? Why did you encounter in your work, Sandrine, uh, so much volatility? Do we just want to be palliative or also do we want as a response to crisis be curative and preventive more? Thank you. And finally in this round, over here. I wanted to ask uh, what could be done to increase core support for the UN of aid, where I see that uh, too much aid given to some of the UN agencies is given only for projects and not for core support, which is so needed in a whole range of areas, and too many donors just give it to the World Bank rather than to the UN. Okay, so I'll ask my, my speakers to try and address the questions. Um, whoever wants to offer his first word, Rob. Um, <clears throat> we've taken a, a couple of the, the questions, maybe not all of them. Uh, let's first start uh, with the question from Thomas on food distribution, food conservation. Uh, didn't address it in this uh, talk, but of course we do a lot on trying to um, 
first improve things along the food chain and uh, <coughs> where we see major uh, new dynamics emerging as soon as you introduce cold storage, cold transportation and processing capacity, then you see both the distribution improve, but also great new dynamics for the um, uh, agricultural sector uh, and having less losses. Um, that point before I get to the, well maybe just, and of course that also uh, helps reduce food losses and food, and also food waste. Uh, so we, we estimate about 30% of all uh, after deducting normal loss of, of uh, from processing that 30% of all food gets lost or waste, wasted during the whole food chain process. So with these kind of uh, <coughs> things that you mentioned, that a lot of things can change. And we, also, we do see um, with both positive and also challenging effects from the, the changes we see in food systems um, driven by what, what some call the supermarket revolution with big players, but that they have brought new dynamics to the system because they do demand that food is being uh, transported and uh, cons conserved in, um, in, in ways that would not affect uh, the food safety and the quality of food. Um, so, but let me not dwell on that, but, but we clearly try to uh, help not just the agricultural production side, but along the whole uh, food value chain side and support in governments to improve that. And that will be critical for food security moving forward. Um, that also partly addresses um, some of the problems we face with, with uh, volatility in food security and agricultural livelihoods. So we see a lot of <coughs> talk about volatility in, um, in uh, food prices. We think of often about the world markets, right? But it's much more important to look at the volatility, what's, how it affects farmers on the ground and, uh, and consumers uh, on the ground. And there we see lots, in a lot of contexts, a lot of volatility in food prices because of a lack of infrastructure and means to store production. So you get a lot of farmers that produce all on the same cycle, right? So once the harvest is there, and there's little capacity to process, to store. You get a lot of seasonality also in the prices, and that's, you could call it a normal volatility, but it's, it's a major problem for farmers uh, uh, if the infrastructure is not uh, right. Um, so we, we do make that distinction. Of course, what I talked about in, in my <coughs> presentation was uh, more about the um, the big events, the catastrophic events, and how we prepare for that uh, natural hazard, but that all ties in with this broader development approach by which you build resilience, um, not just against, uh, <coughs> through weather resilient infrastructure and so on, but particularly the livelihoods are more resilient. And that builds in also being prepared and being resilient against both the normal shocks as well as uh, these uh, bigger uh, events. Um, okay, but maybe but just a comment on, on Richard's question on, on the core support. Um, <coughs> we weren't not specific what you meant by the core support. Of course, uh, the UN agencies, they do get a core support out of the, uh, the regular contributions uh, from from the member states, which are sort of defined contribution percentages of uh, GDP, and that applies to all agencies, the UN Secretariat as well as the specialized agencies. Um, what is, and I guess that's what you're hinting at, is that the, those contributions in terms of levels more or less have been fixed, uh, even in our case as FAO, in nominal terms, right? So meaning in real terms, have been going uh, down that, that kind of support. So for FAO it applies that the core support for the overall activities is about 35% of our activities and the rest are voluntary contributions in projects. And I do agree is that maybe it's not the point that um, you get this distribution but that the, um, the other support, the 65%, does come in the form of, of projects and typically small projects. And that's sometimes fragments the work we can do. If we would get more of the funding 
both through multi-donor sort of programmatic support, we probably could create a lot more critical mass, including for the lines of actions which I mentioned, because a lot of these lines of actions are indeed supported by, um, by donor through uh, aid resources from various uh, sources, um, but all for specific activities. And uh, it's often very challenging to put that together in the water package. So I take your point in that sense. That so it, it, not so much core support versus the others, but that programmatic work can get more solid uh, support to beef up our capacity. I think that will be uh, important uh, to look at. Um, I don't know if Sandrine, Edward, or Finn want to add comments on that, Finn? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for um, good questions. I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm perfectly available to elaborate in, in, in lunch. Um, in my job, uh, I do a lot of reviewing. Um, I see a lot of papers. The last five one I've seen on aid uh, are all about the fact that Paris is dead, the AAA is no longer relevant. That's the point of departure of these analytical papers. So basically, no, um, these eight principles that were discussed, agreed, followed up, they're not out there being used in practice. Um, so yes, at DAC OECD, there is a big job to be addressed. There's a lot of work to be done there. And yes, fragmentation of aid effort, it is extremely costly. One of the 240 papers I referred to estimates the cost. It's a big number. So I would suggest that this is an area for improvement. But again, it's also an area we shouldn't be particularly, how can you say, naive about why donors are there, why they're doing what they are. But we can push that, but we should try to be more concrete and specific. Uh, maybe I, I, I may try to volunteer a, a response also to, to the questions about the core support. Um, I, for one, think that the UN should make a major effort to stop coming across as an internally squabbling, fragmented, internally fighting against each other, thinking that it is a zero-sum game, that what one institution gains, the other one loses. Um, there needs to be a very strong focus on clear work program and delivering on promises. If I may, uh, just as an illustration, I think this is one of the things where at WIDA we have been trying to be very clear, and we have tripled our core support over the last five years, because we've been very specific, we've been concrete, we've been clear, and we've delivered. Now, um, another aspect of this is, of course, is that we need, as the UN, to make sure that the information is out there. Uh, Tony uh, will know that we had a visit of one of the executive directors of the World Bank the other day, the other day is about a month ago, and he went on and on about that the only place in the development business where it made sense to put money was in the World Bank, because that was where the big return for the money was. Uh, he became somewhat quiet when I reminded him that the wider output is about the size of the World Bank Research Department. So we do need to somehow get that information out there uh, and be more outspoken about it. Uh, and actually, within the UN, help each other when there are successes. Build on those rather than the opposite. Thank you. Yes, a few comments on, on aid. First, I don't know why aid has now only been discussed among the Club of Donors in OECD, that committee. I guess uh, the, in, in the past, when I started diplomacy, the General Assembly was providing some, you know, some input on that. I'm not, nothing against that, but it, that is the reality today. We have a problem on where you discuss uh, the issues of aid and the principles about aid. Second, I think it's also important to make clear that sometimes aid is very important to resolve other crises. I'm thinking pandemias, you know, even uh, migration, etc. So, and that you need to see how I think yesterday we said how we you contabilize. I mean, this is aid really or something different because it's helping both sides. And normally it was said yesterday, but I think that is a, is very important. Uh, and, and 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 third, uh, my last comment is regarding uh, innovative finance. It's not terribly important in numbers, but we have been doing that with Brazil, I, I will say, and, and, and I guess the UK and France, and I've been on that, those meetings. And let me say that very, I was very well impressed in the sense how things are dealt. 
just because there is not the feeling of it's always of donors and recipients. I remember we have a, and this was a meeting in Paris, just to decide after five years of, of what was called a, 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 you know, a fund against uh, um, hunger and poverty, and that word came from former president uh, of Brazil. And uh, when you sit down and discuss the question of aid and where you're going to use it and how you're going to use it, in our case, it was a two dollar for you know tickets on airplanes. So it was five million. It was not big quantities, but five million dollar for Chile was important, and Brazil was more, France was other. You have in the same floor not only those countries who were providing the money. You go. We received also many people who were coming from Africa because this was money given for, uh, you know, malaria fightings and these kind of things. So the, the actual people from the communities, local communities, you get also other representatives. It was really a multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, kind of. So it was the discussion was different because there were not only the, 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 the I will say, the donor, on only the recipient, but also those who were, so it was a very practical thing. And, and, I, and just uh, as I'm a Chilean diplomat, we, I must say that we have a fund against hunger and poverty that was decided by the Congress. And, and every year we need to provide $5 million, you know, for South-South aid, and it should go through any international United Nations, so it's not go bilateral, so it's not being used to say, look, I know I'm, it is Chile who is given that. It is always go through UNDP project, MOE, health, uh, so, and I think it was a very clever thing for us country of the South to say, look, we need to use the United Nations, you know, it is there. You don't need to create a special thing, but it is just because if you have $5 million in 30 countries or 40 countries, I think it's a good idea to have this kind of South-South uh, aid. Unfortunately, now that we are doing that, we have been graduated by the OECD DAC committee, and that creates a terrible problem for our triangular cooperation while trying to explain to them that they are losing countries that are doing something because uh, they decided that our, you know, Chile and Uruguay were too, I mean, uh, so that is a fight we have there in Paris, but uh, let me say that some people sometimes don't understand, you know, the importance of just supporting these new donors rather than creating this kind of uh, a, a, a problem. Thank you. Uh, Sandrine, any comments? OK, so um, because I'm really worried that you're going to go hungry, um, um, I suggest that we continue this debate over lunch. Um, Finn had asked me to do a wrap up. I'm not sure I can do that, because I think we had a very rich um, number of presentations from different perspectives. Um, the original kind of pessimistic tone from Eduardo, I think, was to a certain extent balanced by a more proactive and forward-looking message from both our other three speakers, uh, either on how to act, on how to develop those priorities, and particularly at the end that actually aid matters, and we have proof that it matters um, significantly. Um, Eduardo had, I think, mentioned Hadley Bull, if I remember well. Um, Mr. Bull uh, suggested that uh, at any point, international society is a mixture of anarchy and society. And the question is, um, where is the balance and where the trend is? Um, to a certain extent, I think uh, the balance is uh, we still need to figure it out, but if we, we have the tools. And the trend seems, if I have heard well, um, overall positive. Thank you very much. See you at lunch.